and welcome back. Um, we are going to tackle the part B of this, which in some sense might be easier because everything is along the one dimension. This is the second special case, which is along the axis. So we're going to go pick a point P somewhere here, which is Y away from the origin. So we know that in this case, our P is equal to Y in the J hat. So we'll again follow through all the steps, finding the contribution of each of the charges, summing them vectorially with i, j, k component, which I guess you should suspect already that it's only in the j component that matters, to find ultimately the magnitude of the electric field there. And arguably this might be more uh, important as a result because typically when you have an external charge, all your dipoles tend to align towards the external charge. So it's really the electric field along this line that will matter most in terms of the attraction. So let's go through the steps. KQ1 over R1P square hat R1P hat. And the R1P in this case is again final minus original, final being the point. So we have RP minus R1. And in this case, both of them are in the J direction. So you have Y j minus a j so you have y minus a all bracket j so r1p as a magnitude that's just y minus a and the hat the unit vector being a 1d thing we no longer have to do the division because we're dividing by the same thing we just know it's in positive j direction provided that we're going to make an assumption here y is greater than zero and also greater than a because of the condition that they gave us and subbing everything in, we'll get k positive q over y minus a all square in the positive j hat direction. Similarly, we do e2p, we'll use the negative charge here, and then we'll concern ourselves with the displacement factor from point 2 to point p. We have rp, which is y in the j hat, minus, in this case, a negative a j hat. So we'll get y plus a instead of y minus a, as we have before. And so underneath you have that square and the unit vector is still pointing upwards from point two to point P, positive J hat. Now, of course, there's a negative over here, so that's gonna make the electric field itself point down. Putting these together, we can factor some stuff out just to make our lives easier. KQ can come out front, your J hat can come out back. Then we have one over Y minus A square plus a negative anyways y plus a square combining these things you need a common factor on the bottom and then you multiply whatever's missing to the top so in this case you're missing that from the one top and then missing the other one from the other top or j hat expanding let's keep that bracket around because of this minus sign we don't want to screw up the sign and then minus a times minus a gets you a square all over. I'm going to distribute the bottom a little bit different. Y minus a square is just y minus a times y minus a. And y plus a square is y plus a times y plus a. I'm going to write it like that because each one of these, y minus a times y plus a is y square minus a square. It's another one of those special ones that we often see. So from on top, you'll see that a bunch of things cancel out because you have y square minus y square. You have a square minus a square. And then you have this that's left over. So you have kq with 2ya minus negative 2ya. So you can add them all over y square minus a square. And you have that twice. j hat 4ya on top. And this here is our precise expression for what the electric field is at point P anywhere along the Y axis, given that it's a distance Y away. To get to the answer, again, we make use of the approximation condition that they tell us. In this case, Y is much, much greater than A, so you're far away from the dipole, because the, typically the dipole is nanometers in terms of separation. For the same reason as part A that we've seen, we can say that if a is really small and you square it, it becomes extra small. And y squared minus a squared is basically y squared. So given that approximation, we don't change any other thing except for 
the bottom. So y squared minus a squared is simply y squared squared again. And you see how this makes the math a lot simpler to deal with and make it a lot easier to talk about the results. Then you have y to the fourth, except you have one on top, so you have y cubed underneath. That familiar cube again, you have 4a over y cubed in terms of j hat. And again, we replace the k with 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So then the 4 and this 4 cancels out. You get q over pi epsilon naught, a's on top, and we have y cubed on the bottom. Keeping just the magnitude, we drop the j. We put an absolute value sign on our y just in case if it's negative. And these can all be shown for y less than 0 on the other side. Everything works exactly the same. You can work out that as long as you're on the outside of the dipole, the electric field here will always point upward on both sides of the dipole. And again, this shows that the electric field here is directly proportional to 1 over y cubed, very similar to the other way. So again, it's an inverse cube relation, not an inverse square relation, as we're used to with Coulomb's law. The very last thing to point out, just to cap it off, you see that in both of these expressions, this q times a comes up quite a bit. So it's convenient to describe a dipole using something that relates to q times a. And this is what we call a dipole moment using the symbol p hat. Unfortunately, it looks it's just like momentum, but it's not. Dipole moment is a vector that has the magnitude one of the dipole charge, not both of them, not the sum of them, but whatever is the equal and opposite charge times the separation. And it always points in the direction from the negative to the positive, And that's called a dipole moment. And that's going to be useful in talking about torque on a dipole in the electric field and also the magnitude of the electric field given off by the dipole itself. So while these are special cases, I want to once again emphasize that the initial approach in treating a dipole is there's nothing special about them. It's just two charges in space. They happen to be equal and opposite, but you just treat them as two discrete charges in space, find out the electric field from each of them, or the force, whatever it may be, and you just do the same thing as you always do. 